Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, this tree is a place that I love very much. It's just uh, above Glasgow and uh, somewhere, you can even see my bicycle there somewhere in the corner. And uh, it's a tree that always grounds me and uh, makes me feel happy. Um, it's the backdrop for a quotation. Graham Greene in 1944-43 wrote the book The Ministry of Fear, set in the context of London during the Blitz. It tells the story of Arthur Rowe, who's been persecuted and chased by uh, Nazi agents. The quotation here, I think, is very opposite from my talk this evening. It is impossible to go through life without trust. That's to be imprisoned in the worst cell of all, oneself. And for me, there are two sides to that quotation. One side of that quotation is that very often the experience of psychosis is one of uh, experiences of paranoia, of voices, uh, not being able to trust people. So there's a, a prison that comes from the experience of psychosis. But there's another prison. And there's a prison that we create as a society. And that prison is designed, de defined by stigma, stereotyping, prejudice, and most importantly, discrimination. And I think there's something that we can all do uh, with that. So thinking about psychosis, we can think about some of the experiences, first of all, that, that characterize psychosis. Um, one of the very common experiences are experiences of paranoia. So thoughts of suspiciousness, paranoia, often unfounded that somebody or people or organizations are trying to harm you or trick you or hurt you. But think about it for a moment. Think about it. You're on holiday. You're lost. You find yourself in a dark street. You're looking for someone to help you. The only people that you can see are these people who maybe look very shady and very untrustworthy and very dangerous. It kind of makes sense in that context to be paranoid. In fact, paranoia might well be a useful survival strategy. So it's something that is part of our human experience. But for the experience of psychosis that can come to dominate, this quotation describes that. I was terrified that people would laugh at me, ridicule me or trick me or hurt me in some way. You know, my, you know, mind games. People were out to harm me. And I remember having these types of thoughts all over the years. But they would be kind of short-lived and transient. But eventually it was kind of, it became my way of thinking. It dominated my world. Another important experience is the experience of hearing voices or seeing things. Now hearing voices in some cultures will elevate your status. Hearing voices can signal that you have access to important messages from your forefathers or ancestors. In our culture, it doesn't carry that kind of meaning. In our culture, it carries the meaning of madness, of insanity, of being dangerous, of being unpredictable, of being irresponsible. Listen to this quotation. My voices have my entire back catalogue. They have my entire diary. They can pick things that have happened years ago and show a symbol of it, show a picture of it. And it's a horrible experience because you begin to relive those experiences. What this guy is telling me here is how the voices know the things that have happened to him. And they sort of reach into his memories. And they don't just pick any memory. They pick the memory that he just doesn't want to think about. And for him, the experience of hearing voices can be humiliating degrading and corrosive to his, uh, to his uh, feelings of self-esteem. So I want to say, first of all, in my work as a clinical psychologist, in my work as a, as a researcher over the years, some of the most inspiring and strongest and most resilient people that I've worked with have been people with lived experience of psychosis. But also for those individuals, they have, they, they have experience of, experiences that can block them being able to reach out, being able to seek support. And, and for all of us, our relationships are key to our well-being, are key to our recovery, our sense of connectedness, our sense of who we are. And although many of the people who I work with here in Glasgow and the research that we've done, we're able to show that people make a strong recovery and a good recovery, 
One of the key blocks to recovery is stigma, and is the stigma particularly of psychosis. And let me try and illustrate how, how I think stigma works. Stigma is something that happens between us. It happens in our relationships. So it starts with stereotypes, ideas that psychosis is dangerous, that somehow it's linked to violence. And these are ideas that are promoted by irresponsible media. It happens, and it still happens now. Or the idea that people with psychosis are somehow different, that we, that we other the experience and make it different to us. And those perceptions, those stigmatized perceptions of psychosis, create feelings within us. Feelings of embarrassment, feelings of discomfort, perhaps for some feelings of, of fear. And with that fear comes a, a, a desire to distance ourselves. Distance ourselves socially or distance ourselves emotionally. That's how stigma happens. That's how public stigma happens. And that impacts that's felt and that's experienced, either because of the expectations that we bring about psychosis or because of the actual experiences of discrimination. When we distance somebody, when we say, I prefer not to have somebody with psychosis as my girlfriend or as my boyfriend, as my babysitter, as my next door neighbor, what we're doing is an act of discrimination. We are distancing that individual and that's felt. And that's felt by individuals and internalized. I'm different to others. People are going to think I'm crazy. And what are the associations between feeling crazy? And with those feelings comes feelings of shame, embarrassment, humiliation, a desire to withdraw, a desire to disconnect. Now, we know these are very powerful changes that happen in early psychosis. We know that the risk time for suicide in psychosis is that in these early years, and we know that feelings of shame and feelings of stigma arise before those feelings of hopelessness. And so we can think about how stigma is enacted through our relationships. Now, there's been measures over the years to counter this. Um, public health uh, campaigns, anti-stigma campaigns, have worked hard to portray uh, to the public that, stigma, that psychosis is not about danger, it's not about violence, it's an illness, it's a disorder, it requires treatment. Has this changed stigma? Or has this changed discrimination? It hasn't. The evidence is that people are less likely to endorse beliefs about dangerousness, but are more likely to endorse beliefs about people being different, people needing help, that process of othering, and actually those beliefs about distancing, about do I want this person as my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my babysitter, my neighbor, those haven't changed over the years. And that is a major public health crisis. If we're going to tackle stigma, we need to tackle stigma in its broadest context. Stigma and discrimination, prejudice and stereotypes only exist within the context of power. Only exist within the context of a power relationship. Those who determine what is stigmatized are in a powerful position in our society. Therefore, if we want to tackle stigma, we need to go well beyond awareness campaigns. We need to reach out and think about where those sources of power are. So what can we do? Well, I'm going to call first upon uh, some inspiration. Um, John Bowlby was a psychiatrist. And John Bowlby taught and uh, uh, discovered that core to our resilience as individuals are our relationships throughout the lifespan. Our relationships are the basis for our resilience, our coping, how we understand and think about ourselves, how we understand others, our abilities to connect, our resilience to stressful life events, to traumas, all of those things, exist in the context of our relationships. And his quotation here, I think, brings for me a lot of hope. It's the idea of two important principles, um, uh, common humanity, that we all can experience 
unfavorable life events and we're, we're not invulnerable to uh, painful outcomes. Any one of us under certain experiences of stress or strain can experience psychosis. And with this quotation also comes hope and hope of recovery. So how can we bring this to stigma? All kinds of minds, that's the title tonight. What does that mean? For me that means we take all kinds of minds. Our minds are diverse, they're rich, they're different, our experiences are diverse, are rich, are different. We should be valuing experiences of psychosis. They tell us something important about what it is to be human, not othering those experiences. So that idea of common humanity, that psychosis is on a continuum of a human experience and is, a, is an important part of normal human experience. Hope and recovery. Hope and recovery are core to how we can support services, how we can support individuals in having a sense of optimism, having a sense of um, reconnecting with the world, respecting expertise. So much expertise um, is placed on professionals like me, but you've heard tonight expertise that has come from lived experience. And lived ex we need to raise lived experience to the same level of expertise and respect that expertise and ensure that that expertise is incorporated into our institutions. Empowerment. Somebody once said the bigotry, the soft bigotry of low expectations. In fact, I think it was George W. Bush. I never thought I'd quote him. <laughs> This, but the soft bigotry of low expectations. Pessimism about recovery is toxic and corrosive. So having our public services and our therapies focused on empowerment, the promotion of autonomy, independence, decision making are key to tackling stigma. Sharing knowledge. If we truly respect the expertise and empower people with experience of psychosis, then creating the opportunities to have conversations, um, to share expertise, to begin to bring diverse ideas that can then help us solve tricky, difficult problems. We, ha we haven't solved the problem of stigma by just looking towards the experts. We need to widen the conversation to include a broader church and a broader community. Having a focus on relationships so much of our treatments focus on getting rid of symptoms, getting rid of experiences, but so little focuses on normalizing those experiences and actually thinking about what are the relationships that can protect and enable recovery to happen. So having a greater focus on creating peer connections, uh, protecting family connections, but also reaching out to communities and public health. We have a public health crisis and stigma. And I think we have a duty um, to, to, uh, to act on that and to tackle um, how stigma is maintained. So we come to another picture, the same tree, another time of the year. And I, want you to th and I want to just say two more things, really. So the first thing I want you to do is think about something you can do after tonight that it would enable you to tackle stigma. Maybe it's just sharing with a friend what you learned tonight and what you find out, the stories that you've heard, that breaks down and normalizes and uh, opens up the diversity of experiences, enables those to be talked about in an open way. But think about one thing that you can take away and do yourself. The other thought I want to leave you with is uh, somebody much wiser than me talking about her recovery. I'll read it. I'm not ashamed about it in any way, shape or form. And to be quite truthful, this probably sounds really strange, but as much as there's been an awful lot of heartache surrounding my illness and my family, my mum and my dad, my sister, my friends and stuff, and to extend myself, you know, but if I was to go back and change, if I had the power to go back and change, I'd say no, because then I wouldn't be who I am today with the insight that I've got and the experiences I've got. So why would I not change that? So here we see courage, uh, compassion, 
and valuing of experiences as a source of, as a source of growth and learning. Thank you very much.